Welcome to this week's study on 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We have been journeying through the book of Mark, and I hope that you have fallen in love with this gospel that you can carry around with you, not just on paper, but in your heart. I know that I have. And as we begin to study today, I just want to repeat the offer that we've shared many times. If you would like the study notes that we're using as we present, just send us an email to ssp at 3abn.org, and we will get you on the list and you'll be receiving those notes every week, and we pray that they will be a blessing for you. Now, as we begin going through the book of Mark this week, we're going to, uh, the, the last, next to last lesson, let me share with you who we have here sharing with us today. First, on my left here, Brother Ryan Day. Thank you, Daniel. I have Monday's lesson entitled, Hail, King of the Jews. Mm-hmm, King of the Jews. And then Pastor Lomake. I have Tuesday's lesson titled, The Crucifixion. We're going to take a twist on this, mm -hmm. not what you're thinking of. All right. Could not be a more serious topic. Jill. Thank you, Daniel. On Wednesday, I have forsaken by God. All right. And then finally, Pastor Rafferty. Good to be here, Daniel. I have Thursday's lesson, Laid to Rest. Laid to Rest. Mm -hmm. Every one of these titles already gets me ready to be led by God into what he has for us today. Uh, Ryan, would you be willing to open us with prayer today? Absolutely. Father in heaven, Lord, again, we give this time to you. We dare not approach a study of your word without first asking for the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, just humble us. This is a very solemn, deep, deep topic, Lord, that um, is meant to be uh, approached uh, in the right spirit mm -hmm. and in the right way. And so, Father, I pray that each and every one of us will be humbled by today's lesson. And uh, more than anything, Jesus Christ uplifted as he should be. We give this time to you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, this week 12's lesson is essentially kind of a part two of week 11. The title for week 11 was Taken and Tried, and now this week's lesson title is Tried and Crucified. My name's Daniel Perrin, and I have Sabbath afternoons and Sundays portion called Are You the King of the Jews? And the memory text for this week's lesson is in Mark chapter 15, verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, the lesson author uh, indicates in Sabbath's lesson that there is irony in this story. Irony is a literary technique where truth is expressed through the unexpected in a way that you would not anticipate it. And this here, the story of Jesus' death, is the story of all stories. It's more than just a story in a worldly sense with literary technique judged by uh, the human standards of literary merit. But we definitely will see the irony in the unexpected we find the truth revealed. The Gospels are the story of Jesus' death and resurrection with unusually long introductions. Every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tells the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. They don't tell all the stories, perhaps, of his birth. Uh, there are some that, don't, that leave out certain details, but every gospel tells the story of his death. From the details of the four gospels put together, we have a full picture of what Jesus experienced that goes beyond Mark's record alone. None of the Gospels give every single detail, but we put them together. But God gives us four Gospels for a reason, so we can be going back and forth, comparing Scripture with Scripture that teaches us how to go through God's Word and listen to Him everywhere that He speaks. From all four Gospels, we can put together what Jesus faced. He faced six interrogations in less than eight hours. Mark tells us detailed only two of them, the night trial before the religious leaders and Jesus' trial before Pilate. And he makes a very brief reference to the trial before the Sanhedrin after the sunrise. And in these experiences, Jesus is facing people who are venting their anger. Uh, they use every evil tactic, mocking his relationship with his father, mm. mocking his teachings, mocking his kingdom and his love. He will see faces distort, distorted by demonic rage, spitting out satanic accusations. Jesus faces 10 times where people call for his death and express their absolute hatred of him. 
four unrestrained beatings, two at the hand of church leaders, one by the permission of Herod, and a final beating for fun from the Roman soldiers, including the crown of thorns pressed into his scalp. Two public scourgings where Jesus goes into shock, plus the abuse that he suffers at the hands of men being dragged from court to court, all while he suffers the spiritual abuse indescribable by the demons that surround him. All of this with zero witnesses who speak in his defense. No support even from his closest friends. Mark chapter 15 verses 1 to 15 is the subject of this lesson right here that I'm covering. Immediately, verse 1 in Mark 15, immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus, led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, it is as you say. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you? But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate was amazed. This phrase right here, King of the Jews, occurs 15 times in Mark 15. Now, Luke 23, verse 5, actually details the accusations that uh, the Jewish leaders are bringing before uh, Pilate. Mark doesn't mention them, but we know that, that they are not silent, the Jewish leaders. They are, they are just putting every effort that they can to distort Jesus' character before this political leader who has the power and the authority to put Jesus to death. Now, here's the irony. Jesus is the king of the Jews not only of the Jews, but he's the king of all people. In Samuel's day, the people of Israel had clamored for a king because they were rejecting God as their king. And so God used their rejection of him to establish a divine kingship in Israel that would point forward to a true king. And we find this referenced by prophets like Isaiah in chapter 11, where he talks about a rod coming out of Jesse. And this would, is a reference to Jesus as the king. Now, Jesus fulfilled what Isaiah said. He fulfilled what the prophets said about uh, the prediction of a Messiah, of a king. But when he finally came, the Jews rejected him as their king because he was not the kind of king that they were looking for. They were expecting someone that would come in the form and likeness of them and not in the form and likeness of God, which is someone who is humble, who is lowly, who puts others first, who doesn't, who doesn't uh, advance his kingdom through manipulative power. And yet Jesus fulfills the prophecies before their eyes. They're watching the fulfillment of prophecy and still refusing to believe it. Here's irony again. While they are, uh, they are defending themselves, exercising their role as the defenders of God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so we get to John 1, 11, which says this. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Mm -hmm. Instead, he's now brought face to face with a representative of the ruler of the kingdom that is not his own. An innocent king condemned as a criminal, he's being questioned by a guilty criminal dressed as a king. Jesus could in a moment, he could in a moment uh, unmask Pilate for who he is, an imposter to power. And yet Jesus is honorable even with Pilate. He treats him with respect. He treats him with loving kindness. And Jesus is, in essence, he's actually reaching out to Pilate and offering him the decision to see Jesus' identity as the true king. Jesus holds Pilate's life in his hands, and yet he places his life in the hands of Pilate. The almighty creator who is sovereign over the kingdoms of earth submits to the ruling decisions of an earthly king. Now, Pilate has seen men grovel for their lives. He knows what that's like. But Jesus is not motivated by this all-encompassing uh, desire to save his life. Instead, he has the absolute willingness to lay down his life, but not foolishly by some sort of condemnation of himself, 
Pilate had never seen anything like this before and he didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. If Jesus had simply said, yes, I'm the king, then he would be condemned. Instead, Jesus says, it's as you say, and Pilate is, is, is required now to investigate further. Jesus does not defend himself. And that becomes a lesson for us. 1 Peter 2, 23 describes this, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. So many more wonderful statements like this. Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 50, verse 6 and 7, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Mm -hmm. I want to go down to verse 6 in chapter 15. Now at the feast, he was accustomed, this is Pilate was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. All four gospels mention Barabbas. Jesus is innocent. Pilate recognizes it. Barabbas is guilty. Pilate recognizes that too. Jesus is the rightful king. Barabbas is the rebellious subject. Jesus came to break chains and set captives free. Barabbas is chained with cr criminals. Jesus gives life. Barabbas is a murderer. Jesus is the one we need, yet Barabbas is the one the crowd wants. Jesus is the only begotten son of the father. And Barabbas, bar Abba, his name means son of a father. 1 Peter 3, 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sin, sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Barabbas is on the wrong side of the equation in every single way. And Barabbas represents you and me. We're those ones who are chained we're the ones who are murderers. If you have hated someone in your heart, you have essence, in essence murdered them. We are the ones who are the rebellious subjects. We are the ones who are guilty. And yet Jesus is traded here as if he is currency. How often have we done the same thing? Traded Jesus what we need for what we really want instead. Well, what we need is the one who lays down his life. He truly is the king of the Jews. Will we allow him to be king of our lives and call him Lord and submit to him? Amen. Thank you so much, Daniel. That was a powerful lesson. And uh, something tells me that this message or this lesson this week is going to shake a few of us. Uh, just because the very nature of it, when you start to look at the final moments of Christ's life, um, you can't help but be just pricked at the heart mm -hmm. and, and, and really touched. Um, my name is Ryan Day. I have Monday's lesson entitled, Hail, King of the mm -hmm. Jews. And our journey in, in Scripture begins in Mark 15, verses 15 to 20. So if we'll go there now, Mark 15, verses 15 to 20. And this is what the record of Scripture says. It says, so Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him away into a hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison, and they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him, and bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off of him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Uh, I just want to just give a disclaimer here. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about some very sensitive things uh, over the next few minutes. So if there's anyone watching that uh, might have a little bit of a queasy stomach uh, with, with these type of things, I would say just might want to step away. But uh, I don't bring about these things necessarily to gross anyone out. But, you know, for the longest time, I've always wondered if we fully comprehend and understand what it means in Hebrews chapter 12 when it says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. 
you know, we don't want to necessarily uplift or overemphasize the grossness of the experience of Jesus. But yet I think sometimes we, we see pictures or we see images or little clips and it some, sometimes really totally uh, underwhelms the experience very, very much. And I just want to communicate here that uh, when it says here that they scourged him, uh, before taking him out to be crucified. Um, I've wrote, written some papers on this when I was in college, when I was a history major, uh, taking a class in, uh, in early Christian history. And it's quite interesting that uh, this Jesus would have had to undergo what's called Roman flogging. And a lot of times we have in our mind just simply by reading the scripture that he was just beaten with some reeds and, you know, maybe slapped around a few times and then taken out and nailed to a cross. Uh, that is far from the truth. Flogging was a legal preliminary to every Roman persecution or execution in this case. And only women and Roman sen senators or soldiers, except in cases of desertion, uh, were exempt. The usual instrument was a short whip with several single or braided leather thongs of variable lengths in which small iron balls, sharp pieces of sheep bone, glass, and various metals were tied at intervals. Uh, for scourging, the man uh, was stripped of his clothes and his hands were tied to an upright post. The back, buttocks, and legs were flogged either by two soldiers known as lictors uh, or by one who alternated positions. The severity of the scourging depended on the disposition of the lictor and was intended to weaken the victim to a state just short of the collapse of death. As a Roman soldier repeatedly struck the victim's back with full force, the iron balls would cause deep contusions and the leather thongs, sheep bones, and glass would cut into the skin and uh, subcutaneous tissues. Uh, then, as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Uh, pain and blood loss generally set the stage for circulatory shock. This extent of blood loss may have well determined how long the victim would survive on the cross. After scourging, the soldiers would often, as we just read, taunt their victims. This is a very, very hard scene to even try to even think or ponder. But you would think what Jesus had went up, had already experienced leading up to this would have been enough shame and enough punishment for, as, as, as Daniel brought out very accurately, he was beaten and smacked on four different occasions in some capacity, two of which prior to this had already happened by the church leaders, <laughs> by the people, the Jews themselves, as he was being punched and smacked and spat on. Um, but, you know, as I was reading through this, it, of course, it brought my mind back to Isaiah 53. Uh, I just want to read that for those who may have never heard this passage before. Isaiah 53, the Holy Scripture say in verses 3 to 7, it says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he was born, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Right. The whipping, the beating, the scourging, uh, the, 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 the fleshly beating that he received, we deserve. He didn't deserve it, for he had never sinned, but he took it for us. It says in verse 6 in Isaiah 53, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh, in this, you read in the passage earlier where we just read from Mark uh, chapter 15, where it says that they gathered the garrison around. Uh, this, according to history, a group of soldiers uh, that in, in some cases could be anywhere from 200 to 600 men. So this wasn't just a small little, tiny little group as you might have seen depicted in some, uh, in some uh, movies or clips. Uh, this was a large group of men that took 
that took, uh, this was a form of, of entertainment for the Romans. Uh, they would have gathered to see the whipping and then afterwards when they brought him into the praetorium to again take this, twist this crown of thorns and dig it, and st- dig it deep into his skull and you could imagine the blood going down and them wrapping uh, and mocking him and wrapping this purple robe which would only have been given to someone of proper royalty and bowing and worshiping him, smacking him on the head with reeds and then it says they all spat on him Could you imagine being spat on by 200 plus men? Jesus, what he went through, it's it's, it's almost unfathomable to our mind because we weren't there. We don't really truly know. It's interesting though that prior to this, my mind as I was taking this passage in and they're worshiping him in a mocking form, right? Uh, because it actually says they worshipped him. But of course they weren't worshipping him uh, in recognizing who he truly was. It was, as the scripture says, in mocking him. And it's interesting that as read earlier, and I'm going to read Matthew's account from Matthew 26, verse 63 and 64, just prior to this beating, prior to this Pilate uh, scene that is happening in the the courts of Pilate, we know that Jesus appeared before the Sanhedrin and there Caiaphas, the high priest, questioned him. And my mind went to this because they're all mocking him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And it's interesting that Pilate had asked him this question as brought out earlier in verse 63. It says, But Jesus kept silent and the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are Christ, the son of God. Jesus said to him, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you hereafter, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And it's amazing because at that moment, it says that Pilate ripped his clothes, which interestingly enough, if you read Leviticus 21, was unlawful for a high priest to do, which goes to show you where these men's heart were. How they, Jesus, as we've seen in in previous lessons, Jesus often would point back to the law of Moses, but even the very courts that is condemning a man who had never sinned is in the process of condemning him, breaking their own law. Mm -hmm. And of course, we are told that these men who participate in this beating and uh, piercing him in in this mocking way, Revelation 1, 7, Mm -hmm. behold, he comes with clouds and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. All of these men, all of these people who are responsible for piercing and beating and scourging and mocking the Savior. It says there's going to be a special resurrection for them when Jesus comes back. They're going to see the very king that they mocked, who they put the robe around, who they put the crown of thorns on top and beat him in the head and smacked him and spat on him. They're going to see him coming in the clouds of heaven. And it is there, it says, all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And I love Revelation 19, verse 16 there. And he has on his robe and on his thigh, when he comes back, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hail, King of the Jews, as they smack and mock him. But when he comes back, you better know that Philippians 2, verses 9 to 11, is going to come to pass for every single soul, including us, every person. It says, therefore, God, who has highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name, that the name of Jesus, and at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we're all going to do it at some point, even those who pierced him. So why not give your heart to Jesus today? Don't die for your sins when Jesus has already died for them. Amen. Thank you, Ryan, for taking us so carefully through that lesson. We're going to take a break for just a moment, but we'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the 3 ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back. We're going to continue right away with Tuesday's lesson. Entitled The Crucifixion. Now, I want to take a little different twist on the crucifixion, uh, not to bypass it or overlook it, because we're all talking about it at various levels. We've been dealing with it. I think this is the second lesson that we're talking about it and dealing with it. But I want to talk about 
the crucifixion from a different perspective. And I want to look at it from, the, I call it the trilogy of the crucifixion. Uh, there's a threefold component to it that I've seen that Jesus fulfilled, but then if Jesus was the only one, let me rephrase this correctly. Help me, Lord. Hear me carefully. We are not saved just because Jesus died. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't die, what he did has no impact on us. Mm -hmm. So Galatians 2.20 now takes us from the cross to the character. Let's go to Galatians 2.20. And we're going to talk about the co-crucifixion. Mm. Paul, the apostle, writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So one of the first points that came out to me, to be dominated by Christ, we must be willing to be crucified with Christ. Mm -hmm. In order for him to be exhibited in us, we can no longer be exhibited in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Until we join Christ in his death, we cannot join him in his life. So let me break this down to the first, what I call the co-crucifixion. I'm going to take that passage and break it into two parts. So the first part is the co-crucifixion. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. What, what came to me first was those that crucified Christ did so because they did not want to be crucified. Hmm. Now, not physically, but spiritually. See, we will all be guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus if we refuse to be crucified with Jesus. And so I thought about that. Christ cannot live in us until we are no longer alive in ourselves. So the Apostle Paul talked about what, who died on the cross. When you, when you think about what happened on the cross, Jesus didn't die. He took the nature of Adam to the cross to die. So the physical death he experienced as Christ, the Son of Man, was a literal physical death. But the spiritual side of that was he took the nature of Adam to the cross because the wages of sin is death. There's only one way to get rid of that nature. You have, you have to put it to death. You know, the, the, the husband is alive. The nature is alive as long as the husband lives. Romans 7. So, so Christ had to take the nature of Adam, which is in all of us, to the cross in order that his nature can be exhibited in us. Before Christ is seen in us, the nature in us must be carried to the cross. And so let's, let's look at that very quickly. Romans 7, you alluded to that, Jill. Uh, and I put, Jesus cannot live in us if we insist on living in ourselves. Here's Romans 7, verse 18. And here's the reason why he cannot live in us until we are no longer alive in us. For I know that in me that is in my flesh how much dwells? Nothing. Nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. So the Lord doesn't come into a house that's dysfunctional. Because if he came, into, if we just, if, if Christ just came in us by adoption, so let me just say this, the Christian life is not received by adoption, but it's received by death. So we can't just say, I want to live the Christian life. If it was received by adoption, then Christ was unnecessary. So Jesus had to die in order to make the Christian life available to us. It's not just a lifestyle of changing our diet, our day of worship, our dress, or the way we eat. That's not the Christian life. Those are the, uh, those are the um, accoutrements or the, the, the byproduct of the Christian life. So many of us like what the Christian life offers, but that's not the Christian life. The Christian life begins when we recognize without Christ, there is no Christian life. John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. 
He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So until Christ is abiding in you, you may be living the, 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 um, the ancillary benefits of the Christian life, but you're not living the Christian life because Christ has to be in you. Colossians 1 verse 27. To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let me break this down in a very respectful way. It's not doctrines in us that's the hope of glory. Mm. It's Christ in us that's mm. the hope of glory. It's not the food in us that's the hope of glory. That's why we trip so often on, you know, what the ingredients are, because we're missing that the real ingredients is the Christ in us, not minimizing the health message. We want to be healthy. Thus the life of Daniel, thus the diet in the book of Genesis. But if you put that before Christ, then you are just a healthy sinner. You are not a person that's having Christ abide in you. So until Christ is in us, the glory of Christ will never be seen through us. Christ did not die to preserve us. He died to save us. So, so many people want to be preserved. They said, so what do I have to give up to become a Christian? Everything. Nobody going to the cross said, well, how much of me needs to die? <laughs> we, all of us needs to die yeah. in order for Christ to be exhibited in us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, I'm moving quickly. Speaking like a New Yorker, you listen like a New Yorker. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Mm -hmm. So when you think about this, how can we exhibit righteousness if it's nothing more than merely putting a new battery in us? No, it's not that. Or sitting down and getting some psychological uh, conditioning to say, from now on, this is how I'm going to think. Well, then you become a psychological Christian, but you don't become born again. The whole entrance into the Christian life is death, burial, yes. and then resurrection. Yes. Now, in the interest of time, let's go to Romans 6.16. 6, let's look at the two things that were included in this entire process. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. So until we are crucified, the body of sin, which is what Jesus took to the cross, he took Adam's nature to the cross, the body of sin, so that he can come out of the grave no longer slave to that body. That was Romans 6, 6. Romans, Romans 6, 6, sorry. Yes. Romans 6, 6. Sorry, Romans 6, 16 is... Uh, do you not know? Okay, Slaves. Romans 6, 6. So when you look at that, Jesus took that body to the cross mm -hmm. and the Adam died mm -hmm. so that the Jesus, unhindered, unspotted, could come out completely victorious. And by the way, he didn't take any sin of his own to the cross. Right. He took our sin. Right. Our iniquity was laid upon him. Mm -hmm. So now, but, but if you only die, then you're just dead. So there's not only a co-crucifixion, there's also a co-resurrection. Let's look at that very quickly. Romans 6, verse 1 to 3. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The answer is certainly not. How shall we who, here's the key, died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? This is a completely revolutionized way I look at baptism. So I don't talk about baptism as, well, here are the things that you do as a, as a baptized Christian. Here are the new ways you think and here are the new ways you eat and here's the new ways you dress. You can do all of that and still be lost. If Christ is not abiding in you, if the living Christ is not exhibited in you mm -hmm. and he's not living there. And lastly, in the interest of time, we have to also have a, a co-eternal life. Yes. You see, I have to add this here and I know the time is going to get away from me. I don't often say that, but the reason why the devil told the soldiers to make sure that they secure the stone, and this is powerful, is because he doesn't mind if we die to self. He just wants to keep us dead in self. Mm. He doesn't want us to come forth. He wants to secure us in the condition in which we die, but not experience the condition in which we can live. Mm. So you might say, hey, I died in Christ, but Jesus died, but he came forth from the tomb. And here's my point. The devil may have you in a dead relationship with Christ, but until the stone is rolled away from your life, you will never experience the resurrected life of Christ. Co-crucifixion, co-death, and co-resurrection. And so when we think about that, Jesus rose so that the life that he took to the cross can now be exhibited in us. 
and Christ wants to rise in you so that he can be also seen in you. Amen. Thank you so much. What a powerful lesson, Daniel and Ryan and Pastor John. Thank you so much. I love that. Christ died on the cross for you and for me. He took our sins, but then our responsibility to die to self, to crucify that and let Christ live in us. That's a powerful way to look at the crucifixion. Thank you. Wednesday, I'm Jill Morricone. I almost forgot my day. On Wednesday, we're looking at forsaken by God. Ryan did a powerful job of explaining and expressing the physical pain and agony that our Savior went through even before he got to the cross. This lesson focuses even more specifically on the uh, spiritual separation that Jesus experienced on the cross from his father. So let's look at that. We're in Mark 15, verse 33. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now, if you look at the timeline of the crucifixion, he was crucified at 9 a.m. So starting at noon, from noon to 3 p.m., there was darkness, supernatural darkness, that came in and encompassed Jesus there at the cross. Desire of Ages, page 753. With amazement, the angels witnessed the Savior's despairing agony. The hosts of heaven veiled their faces from the fearful sight. Inanimate nature expressed sympathy with its insulted and dying author. The sun refused to look upon the awful scene. Its full bright rays were illuminating the earth at midday when suddenly it seemed to be blotted out. Where was God? Where was God when Jesus was there on the cross? He was right beside his son. Psalm 18, verse 11, he made darkness his secret place. His canopy around him was dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Now, Jesus couldn't sense that God was there. He didn't recognize the presence of God, but God was there suffering with his son. The next verse, verse 34, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, I can't read that, it's in Aramaic, but it's translated. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Have you ever felt that? Have you ever cried out, God, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? This is what we call the cry of dereliction. Matthew and Mark quote this. It's the cry of pain and anguish and suffering and abandonment and separation from the Father. It's actually a quote from Psalm um, 22, verse 1, this messianic psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning, Jesus on the cross at the moment, last week we talked about in the Garden of Gethsemane, him experiencing that separation from the Father. But on the cross, he experienced it again, this ultimate separation, the sins of the world. Not his sins, as Pastor John brought out so clearly, but my sins, your sins, the sins of the entire world upon him, causing that separation from the Father. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Pastor John read it. I want to read it again. He made, he made him, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Yes. What happened? My sins laid upon Jesus, the perfect lamb of God, the perfect substitute and sacrifice. He took my place on the cross so that I could receive his righteousness. Isaiah 53 verses four to six. Surely he's borne our griefs carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He bore the consequences of all our sin. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. He bears the sin itself. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Verse six, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him, Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. This is substitutionary atonement. 
John right. 1, 29. Remember John the Baptist saying, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is Jesus bearing our curse, Galatians chapter 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law because the wages of sin is death, right. having become a curse for us. Jesus experienced the second death for you and for me. Desire of Ages 753. Satan with its fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through to the portals of the tomb. In other words, on the cross, he didn't know. Is the sacrifice sufficient? Am I going to be resurrected? Am I going to spend an eternity with the Father? He didn't know. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him that the father had accepted the sacrifice. It was the sense of sin bringing the father's wrath upon him as man's substitute mm -hmm. that made the cup he drank so bitter and it broke the heart of the son of God. Mm -hmm. Mark 15, 37, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and he breathed his last. Luke tells us that he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Mm -hmm. Two things happened when Jesus died. We're told that the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This is the fulfillment of Daniel 9, verse 27. Remember, in the midst of the week, he would bring an end to that sacrifice and offering. The lamb was sacrificed. The sacrificial system that the Jews had practiced, looking forward to the coming Messiah, slitting the throat of the perfect lamb, that had met its fulfillment in Christ. Type meets antitype. There is no longer a need for that sacrificial system. And the Roman centurion there at the cross, what did he say? Truly, this was the Son of God. Mark makes a really neat comparison between Jesus' baptism and Jesus' death. You see, at Jesus' baptism, the heavens split. At Jesus' death, the veil was split. At Jesus' baptism, God's voice said, Behold, this is my beloved Son. Hear him. At the cross, at Jesus' death, the centurion said, this man was the son of God. In our remaining moments, I want to give to you five keys for when you feel forsaken by God. Now, I don't think we can ever experience what Jesus experienced with the weight of all everyone's humanity sin on him at the cross. Okay. But there are times where we might feel like God is at a distance. We're not sure where he is. We can't seem to find him. We've cried out for him. God, why have you forsaken me? God, where are you? What are you and I as Christians to do in that moment? Five keys. Number one, be honest with God. Don't be afraid to share your struggle with him. Don't hide your heart from him. He already knows what you're dealing with. He already knows what's in your heart, so don't hide it from him. Number two, remember the past. Remember what God has done. Remember, look back in your experience of your own walk with God. See those ways where he's revealed himself to you. See those ways where you sensed his presence and you can see past whatever darkness and shadow is surrounding you right now. Remember how he's worked in your life in the past. Number three, cling to faith and trust his word. That's what Jesus did on the cross. Even if he could not feel, he could, did not know, but his faith pierced through, his faith reached out. That's what you and I can do. Faith in the authority of the word of God. When it seems that God is silent, you and I are called to trust the promise, mm -hmm. not the perception. We are called to walk by faith, not by sight, to trust him in the storm as well as the sunshine. We trust him by faith, not by how we feel. So claim the promises in his word and put your full faith on the authority of what his word says. Number four, invite other people into your journey. Sometimes I think we have this false sense of righteousness in some sort of isolation. Oh yeah, I can handle this on my own. 
invite other people, godly trusted people to intercede for you, mm -hmm. to stand in the gap when those clouds come about and you can't seem to find the face of Jesus. Invite other people to pray with you through that time. And finally, number five, live with the end game in sight. How did Jesus endure the cross? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was sent before him, mm -hmm. He endured the cross. Know that this world is not all there is. Jesus is coming again. Live with eternity in view. Amen, amen, that's so powerful. Thank you, Jill, for reminding us of the physical, or excuse me, the emotional sufferings that went beyond the physical. And John, thank you for reminding us of the co-crucifixion, the co-resurrection, mm -hmm. and the co-eternal life that we have with Jesus Christ. And Ryan, thank you for reminding us of that physical suffering of Christ that really hit home for me. And then Daniel, a king dressed as a criminal, excuse me, a king dressed as a criminal, judged by a criminal justice dressed as a king. That's powerful, a powerful thought right there. I'm James Rafferty and I have Thursday's lesson which is entitled Laid to Rest. So it's all over by the time we get to this part of the lesson. Jesus Christ has finished the anguish, the physical anguish, the emotional, mental anguish, uh, all of it is finished. He's laid to rest. He's in the tomb. We're looking in Mark chapter 15, beginning with verse 42. And we're going to read through verse 47. And look at the significance now of Joseph Arimathea's intervention, especially because all of Jesus' disciples were nowhere to be found. They had all forsaken Christ by this time. Verse 15, uh, 42 of chapter 15, And now when even was come, because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, that is Friday, Joseph of Arimathea, verse 43, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And calling unto the centurion, he asked him whether he had uh, been in any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, that is that Jesus was indeed dead, he gave the body to Joseph. So Pilate here is amazed that Christ is dead because death from crucifixion was a long lingering process. And Christ was only on the cross for a few hours. And so he wanted to check with the centurion, is he really dead? And this is so important for us, historically speaking, to confirm the death of Jesus Christ, not by his followers, not by Christian authors, writers, or believers, but by uh, secular authorities, so to speak. And then it says in verse 46, and he bought fine linen, that is uh, Joseph, bought fine linen, took him down, wrapped him in the linen, and laid him in the sepulcher, a tomb which was hewn out of rock and rolled a stone under the door of the sepulcher. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, behold, where he was laid. So you see this beautiful picture that's taking place here in the context of the burial of Jesus Christ. And one historical detail that is of extreme importance here, as we noted, is the verification of Jesus' death. Mm -hmm. The quarterly goes on to say, Mark 15, 43 tells of Joseph's request for the body of Jesus, that Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus was already dead. This is very important. He therefore summoned the centurion in charge of the crucifixion, asked if Jesus was already dead, and the centurion confirmed that it was so. So the reason this is important is because the later claim is made that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, that he fainted. And this testimony of the centurion to the Roman governor directly counters that assertion. The Romans did, after all, know how to execute criminals, as Ryan, as you brought out so very clearly. So isn't it ironic, though, that Jesus' followers are missing in action? Isn't it ironic that Joseph of Arimathea comes to the front who was Joseph of Arimathea? He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Mm -hmm. He was a member of that council that really were trying to put Jesus to death. And it is a remarkable revelation of the power of the gospel to recognize that one of the members of the Sanhedrin stands up for Jesus when everyone else forsakes him, mm -hmm. stands up for Christ and uh, seeks to assure that his body is given a decent burial. Is it possible that those who profess to be followers of Christ are going to be missing in action at the very time when others who appear to be immersed in the world, in the councils of this world, who oppose Christ, actually come to the front and stand up for Jesus? 
you know, when the final test comes, we're told that many people are going to forsake the truth who now advocate the truth, and many of those who don't seem to be advocating the truth are going to step into their place. In Revelation chapter 18, God describes this call out of Babylon, this immense uh, religio-political system economically controlling the world. And he says, I've got people in Babylon and I want to call them out. How are they going to come out? I think one of the ways that we see them coming out is revealed through what Pastor John Loma King told us, and that is when God's followers actually are crucified with Christ, mm -hmm. actually are dead with Christ, resurrected with Christ, and living that eternal life of Christ, they're going to be a witness to people, and, and God's people, when they see that, they're going to be stirred to take a stand for Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea is one of the greatest triumphs of the cross. But there's another triumph of the cross, and I think it's beautiful because we know that when we look at the, the records of the gospel, we know that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he went there for us. He went there as the second Adam. And bearing the, the, the responsibility of the entire race as the, the head of the race, as the second Adam, he took upon himself our sins. The, rev, the verse has been given a couple of times, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. He became sin for us that knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God who know no righteousness in him. So there's a great exchange that has taken place here. And as the second Adam, Jesus Christ has accomplished the recreation of the human race. You see, this world was created by God in six days. And when he got to the sixth day, God rested from all his work. On the sixth day, he said, it is finished. Everything's accomplished. And then on the seventh day, he rested from all that he had created and made. And everything he created on those six days, he did by himself. He didn't do it with us because we weren't created until the sixth day. Humankind was created on the sixth day and the first thing that we were asked to do was rest in everything God had done for us. So when we fast forward to the cross, we see the completion of the work of recreation. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, if any man is in Christ, mm -hmm. he is a new creature. That's right. all, all things have, become, have, gone, have gone away and killed. All things have become new. And when we look at that, we realize that we were crucified in Christ in the sense that Jesus Christ being the second Adam was recreating the whole human race in himself. He created a perfect human being, a human being that obeyed Christ, God 100%, never failed, never faltered, never gave into temptation. And as he continued this life of perfection, he also then took our place and received the, the consequences of all our sins and our iniquities. And as he did that, the Bible says, he trod the winepress alone of the people. There was none with him. No one helped him to perfect a Christian life, to perfect the character of Adam, the second Adam, and no one helped him to bear the sins of the world. If anything, we forsook him or added weight to him in that awful time. And then on the cross, as he's finishing this work of recreation, as he's finishing this work of recreating the whole human race all over again, as, as he did it on the sixth day in Eden, so he did on the cross. He gave those same words, it is finished. Mm -hmm. He has completed his work of recreation. Everything necessary for our salvation was accomplished in Jesus Christ. And then he rested on the seventh day mm -hmm. according to the commandment, just like he did in creation after those six days of creation, just so he did in the recreation of the human race. Friday he says the words, it is finished, and then he rests in the tomb on the Sabbath, just like he rested from all his work of creation on the seventh day in the creation of this world. So you have this amazing repetition, if you will, in the life of Christ of the creation of the world, in specific, specifically of the creation of humanity. But you know, it's not just humanity that is redeemed by the cross. If you look in Romans chapter eight, Romans chapter 8 talks about this entire creation being redeemed by the cross. Mm -hmm. It says here, we'll start here in Romans chapter 8 and verse 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected him the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. 
And we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. So what we see here is Jesus Christ is going to deliver. What does it say here? He's going to deliver the whole of creation, the whole of creation that's been subjected mm -hmm. into this vanity, not willingly. All of this is going to be del delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And so we see here as Jesus is laid to rest that it's, yes, it's sad when we think about everything that he endured physically and emotionally. We think about all that we put upon him. But the message of the cross, the message of the, the life and the death and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the message of his being placed in the tomb is a message of great hope to Amen. those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. And we pray that that hope would be yours and may it be ours. Amen. Amen. Thank you each one for taking us through the trial and condemnation, the crucifixion, the death, and then the burial and an invitation to us uh, of Jesus. So let's take the, the last few moments to wrap up with final comments. Absolutely. You know, all of what we've studied, uh, my brain, my mind goes all the way back to just one text. It's been mentioned a couple of times, but I just want to reiterate 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20 and 21. It says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Thank you. I'm going to use that text to segue to the point I want to make. I was going to read that also. Jesus bore every phase of our sin that we may exhibit every phase of his righteousness. Amen. That's powerful. What a powerful study. I just want to remind you that Jesus endured the second death so that you and I don't have to. We can accept and receive the forgiveness that he offers us. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin and we can rise in newness of life. Amen. In John chapter 19, verse 30, when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. He has accomplished our redemption in himself. I'd like to summarize this week's lesson with the words of that old song that you have heard so many times, perhaps, how I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish that old rugged cross where my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it one day for a crown. And this is the thought running through Paul's head in Galatians 6, 14, when he says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a powerful thing to boast in. Now, by all means, come back next week because lesson number 12 is not the end. Lesson 13 is coming next and you've got to hear what it's going to say. The title is The Risen Lord. <laughs>